Welcome to the Finance Committee meeting of March 11th. Uh, we have several groups with us tonight, but first on our list is Veterans Benefits for Reserve Fund Transfer for the current budget year. Uh, this was brought to our attention uh, a couple times previous to now, and I believe they finalized their number. They need an additional 26000 to meet the uh, expense budget of benefits to pay out. Any additional comments? Yeah. Uh, so first, I just want to say Jim <laughs> apologizes that he couldn't be here tonight. The <laughs> <laughs> Sewer Audit Commission meeting. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's right. Now, <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, reserve fund transfer for the Veterans Services Department. Uh, like you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, uh, Jim had brought this to the committee's attention earlier this season. Um, and this request for $26,000 is in line with the initial estimate that he provided the committee a couple weeks ago. Um, this is the to support the local veterans in the Chapter 115 benefits uh, that goes to uh, food, shelter, clothing, medical care, and other uh, services that the Veterans Services Department provides. Um, the initial budgeted amount was for $72,000 as we get into the home stretch of the fiscal year. Um, John, who's here this evening, has identified a, a shortage. Uh, where we're, uh, we're currently in the, the account is about $8,000 left. We need about 26000 to get through the rest of the fiscal year. So uh, the Board of Selectmen took this up at the meeting on March 5th, voted at 500. John, anything else you want to add to that? Or? That was great, Pat. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorable action. So, okay. I have Second. Okay, by <coughs> Susan and Josette. Any questions or comments? Okay. All in favor, uh, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Great Opposed? job, Pat. Abstain. Thank you. Right, thanks, John. 14 0. We'll right. tell Jim you did a great job. All right, thanks. <laughs> Uh, so we get a packed agenda this Let evening. Um, we have our, our articles from the Personnel Board, Walpa Media Corporation, and the Planning Board. And now we have some representatives from all three groups uh, behind me. So I'll introduce uh, Alden Napoli from the Personnel Board, who can kind of uh, get into each of the articles. Mm -hmm. As he's coming up here, I'll just kind of give an overview of each of the articles. Uh, it's Articles 2, 3, and 4. Uh, article 2 is um, it's the personnel bylaws, um, and as, as it turns out, nothing substantial uh, with the rewrite um, this year. I, I do want to commend Valerie. She's reorganized the personnel bylaws into uh, groups that makes it more user friendly, for both employees and administration. Um, so they're broken up into uh, personnel board, schedule, employee, men, employee benefits, leave policies, personnel administration, et cetera. Um, Article 3 is the salary schedule and annual living adjustment. Uh, the personnel board is recommending a uh, couple items, uh, namely the elimination of the mid-mid-max schedule after a few years of trying that out. Um, includes a living adjustment of 2% uh, for FY20. Um, it makes a minor adjustment to the recreation schedule, uh, increasing a couple positions to meet the minimum wage, and adds the new position of deputy building commissioner. <coughs> and then Article 4 is a general placeholder. This recommended no action at this time. Um, in the past, this has been used for the living adjustment that's just built into the budget already. So, a little bit of an overview, and I'll turn it over to the chairman. Thank you. I have not, nothing much more to say. He's a, <laughs> a great job. Um, but um, I do, do want to thank Valerie Chu for her uh, Article 2 changes to the personal bylaws. Uh, Valerie has been invaluable over the years uh, working with the personnel board. And I think um, what she's done here in reorganizing the personal bylaws, um, if you if you look look at them uh, very briefly, uh, the uh, table of contents will show you that the different sections, which you would have to bounce across the whole bylaws to to try to uh, try to put your arms around a certain issue, have now been uh, put in groups uh, that make sense. So that it's much easier to work through the bylaws <coughs> and to understand, you know, where you're looking for for any particular item. So there's no change in any of the wording, no change in anything else but the structuring, so that it lays out for everyone's ease. Um, Article three uh, is a two percent general increase that we voted on. Uh, that was done after we had a. Uh, a many things before us, but we had it done another salary survey uh, done by MML Consulting Group this year. Uh, we've been doing that every three years or so, 
uh, so that we can double check on ourselves to make sure that we're in line with the other comparable municipalities <coughs> and what's going on. And basically, where we're finding out is that our salaries are right there in the middle. Uh, we're not over uh, where the middle is or two below, but we're right there in the middle range and we want to try to stay there. So the 2% increase uh, helps us do that so we can stay competitive uh, with our surrounding um, towns uh, to keep uh, uh, our, our staff that are uh, working here and bringing their expertise uh, to the benefit of the town every day. Um, this new position uh, of Deputy Building Commissioner to help out and then as Pat said, there's a dollar increase to mid-max on the uh, um, recreation schedule. To keep in line with the minimum wage, even though the, the municipalities uh, uh, don't have to follow the minimum wage law and exempt from it, obviously all the private sector does <laughs> and to make sure that we can keep the people that we have in the recreation department uh, with us too, we're trying to stay competitive with the private sector. Uh, and uh, then the last thing is, you know, a few years ago, trying to put our arms around the salary schedule and make adjustments, we adopted for the new hires a min, min, I can never say this, <laughs> so let me try slow, minimum, middle, and maximum, so for words, uh, salary schedule. Um, there's only three people on it. Um, we were concerned, uh, the board was concerned that once more people would be on it, there'd be conflicting salaries between what's on that schedule and what's on the salary schedule because those people would be grandfathered in. And uh, the board voted to uh, do away with that and just keep with the salary schedule. We looked at dropping the first three um, steps in the salary schedule as was um, suggested to us by uh, the uh, survey um, this time around and the last time. Uh, we uh, voted against that at this point, but are looking to go forward, maybe dropping the, the lowest uh, step on the next few years, uh, and we assess that again. That's that's <coughs> kind of the summary, and I'm sure I'll try to answer any questions that you may have. Um, actually, with regards to the survey of other communities, when you said we were right in the middle, is that based on? Meeting. Where th where the steps meet or actual <coughs> staffing, what the average salary is in, in the municipality? Uh, the way they did it was they took the median <coughs> for the minimums for each position. So there were 59 positions that were surveyed for in our schedule, and for each of those positions, they took um, our minimum and compared them with the minimums for all the 20 other communities that were compared, and we were um, in line with. The median of those 20 communities. Okay, okay. so so is a basically a comparison of step ones across all communities. I'm sorry. It's basically a comparison of step one table on the table. Against well, then the also at the far end too, and at the, the other end too. Right. So okay, there were two sets of uh, data: one for the minimums and one for the maximum. Okay. Both cases, we you know that trend was <laughs> was pretty comparable. Lisa, then Ron and Susan. Could you ask through you, Mr. Chairman? Um, I'd like to see that list of 20 communities, and I'd like to know if it's the same list that you use year upon year it, it was there were a couple communities that we added to it um, <coughs> uh, I don't know if I, I can grab that in just a second but as I'm explaining um, there were a couple communities that we added into it I think namely Norwood wasn't included Canton wasn't included these are some areas in the surrounding towns that um, we added to the list of comparison because I mean the purpose of this was to assess our uh, competitiveness with some of the surrounding towns and you know, if we're looking to retain employees, these are potential competitors. So there are some areas within Norfolk County in particular that we added to it, um, you know, given their, their proximity to Walpole and the possibility um, that possibly employees could go there. So your interest in choosing the towns was more based on their geography than their similarity to Walpole? Uh, there were a couple of different factors. It was operating cost, population, um, and proximity to Walpole. I don't know if you have it right here. I do. Have some time, I'll get it. Pardon me? Do you I'll care get, for me to like, read them? Or? No, no. Um, I'm just interested okay. in all the different yeah, sure. bucket lists of comparisons we have with the schools, with the fire, you know, with our fixed costs. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll get it from you sometime. Thanks. Yeah, this okay. is available. Yeah, down we can put personnel board. Yeah, we can share this around too. Yeah. Want a list of <coughs> towns? Will that, will, yeah. will that also be in the no, RTM package? 
I'm yeah. sorry? Will that also be in the RTM package, the survey? Uh, the survey itself, I'm, we can certainly put it online. It's pretty lengthy, uh, okay. so if members are interested, okay. we can certainly. Okay, maybe, maybe take, take a look at it and grab a page or two that kind of summarizes, you know, okay. the findings, just so the RTMs have that extra information. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And Ron and Susan, and then. Um, I was just, I had <coughs> a similar question on that. So at least could you supply us with that, <coughs> that uh, comparison? The because of towns. the list, yeah. list of towns, because I think every time someone's came in and done a presentation, they, you know, they, if they chose 20 towns, we'd have 20 different towns. So it would be helpful, and then especially for questions at town meeting, that we can say, all right, these are the towns. We don't have to rate off all the 20 towns, but so people can see what you did. So it would sure. be helpful mm -hmm. for everyone. Do you have the list there? Uh, yeah. I have the survey here. Yeah, if you want, just, we just read it around. Someone make a copy? Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, if you could. Yeah, it'd yeah. be good to have that. We can we can send around the report after the meeting, and also okay. so you all have it for your file. Yeah, so. no Thank you. Yep. Company was. I'm good. Yeah. Pat, <clears throat> could you repeat the name of the company that did the survey? It's MMA Consulting, uh, not to be confused with the Mass Municipal Association. There's <laughs> a consultant, Mark Morris, um, that he's been involved with our wage schedule, uh, so wage surveys the past few few times. Thank you. So okay. he did it in 2015. I think was the yeah, last one. He did. He did, it, he did it back then as well. And as you were saying, as you've known in the past, people say, well, if you compare, compare them to the W towns, we're always going to be lower. <laughs> and so that's why it helps us to have that type of stuff. Okay. I don't know if you ever heard those type of questions, Mr. DiNapoli. <laughs> Susan? <laughs> My question is, what will happen to the employees who have come in under the minimum, middle, the max I went slowly too. There, there's only three of them. Okay. Um, and they will go on a comparative step. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Okay. You see, no, no one said to shut up your cell phones before the meeting. So. <laughs> <laughs> you should have went off at the beginning. <laughs> so, um, who who will make that adjustment? Uh, we'll presumably, uh, Jim through the personal action okay. request. What we'll do is we'll put them on a, a comparable step, you know, okay. to a position where they won't lose money. Um, so presumably, once with their existing um, salary, we'll slide them in <coughs> so they're and, and equal or above. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, is there any way we can put in a bylaw that prevents Valerie Donahue from retiring? <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Uh, um. <laughs> I've been working with Valerie, you know, back in the day when I was on personnel board, and I just want to give you a, a salute. You've done wonderful work for the town. Thank you. Thank you. She has, but she, I, I know she's working hard to train her successor, <laughs> uh, and I'm sure she will. Uh, uh, stay on top of everything. That's why I made the comment. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we'll get working on that bylaw right away. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, the question I have is, um, do you compare total compensation or just the salaries? Like, for instance, going through our salary wage or stipends issued, it seems for almost anything. Sure. So I'm just, are we comparing apples to apples? Yeah, for the first time this year, we did compare the. the total package of what the take the final take home was so uh -huh. that was included in the results and does it compare also with the retirement and the <coughs> pension benefits so if I'm picking between two towns as we're looking here do we compare against that as well so yeah the retirement that's that's gonna be the same all around Massachusetts you know it's that uh -huh. same um, you know, the same rules apply whether you're working in Walpole or wherever. Right. Um, so it, it wasn't really a, a means for comparison With the, there. The, the OPEB, the health care contributions and such? Yeah, that was that's, included. That's in, part of that the was comparison. Part of the comparison. Yeah. So it's kind of, it is a total comp kind of thing. Yeah, there was there was the, the comparison for both salaries and <coughs> the benefits. So. Okay. There's, a, there's an appendix that compares the health uh, analysis to, mm -hmm. you know, Walpole, uh, just just in general well. there are we comparable on the the health benefits as well or are we more generous or less generous I think we're probably less generous I would say yeah, uh, yeah. depending upon how you decide gener generosity okay. uh, but um, the uh, I think our employees step up more uh, than in most other comparative towns okay Thank any you. other There's something yeah. you know mm -hmm. different but I think if right. you look at it we're probably in the um, lower range of town contribution. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, Jim, Jim had called out that a lot of other communities have not moved off of the 80-20. <clears throat> but the one thing that we do still have is probably one of the most beneficial um, dental plans um, when it comes to employee contributions to the actual dental care, like orthodontists, um, fillings, caps, um, replacements, and so forth. Um, I think the town actually pays 100% of those under the plan, um, where other, community, other communities are on an 80-20 or a 60-40 uh, split. Um, Rich, did you still have a question? Yeah, I had a question for you, Mr. <coughs> Jim and Dale. Um, it kind of goes in with what Mark was saying about the stipends. When you look at this, this is just purely on the classification like town administrator. If he's getting stipends, that's above and beyond anything that shows here, or are they factored into when you this look at this? This is just the base, and excuse me. Yeah, okay. This is just the, for the base, and if I'm not mistaken, yeah. we only have a couple of employees. Excuse me? A couple of get stipends. Yeah, there's so a it, realistically, someone that's making 169 somehow, and I'm not never sure how you get a stipend, uh, maybe a good thing for some people, but uh, that would add into it, correct? On top of the 169, if somebody was at the top of their range, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. could potentially get a $20,000 stipend, right? Well, but, but that's yeah. not factored. That's not, but that, that that's a unique situation that really is driven specifically, you know, by a circumstance. So it's not something that that generally happens. You said union. Funny. What did you no, say? Unique. No, no, unique. It's, it's not union. union. Not union. Yeah. That's what I thought. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, that uh, because I think maybe when you compare them, that <coughs> needs to be looked at. But I'm not sure what the mechanics are. You know, as to total salary. It's not even for the person taking that position. So a lot of times stipends are, are on the person taking the position, not so much the position itself. So you might get a stipend because <coughs> you're certified, you know, um, accreditation. So there's laws that allow you to get a certain amount of stipend. The next person in that position might not have their certification, so they wouldn't get that stipend. And what, what triggers the being a, a stipend available? It's, it's like a degree. Mass General Law, there's a law on it. So if someone has an associate's degree, gets a bachelor's, yeah, they could get a like stipend. The for the police and fire, we have certification. But so not, not, it's no. not common. I just want to yeah. underscore that too. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. They're yeah. not all stipends right. for every So in the town, you know, for the professional no, schedule, there's about two, I think two employees that come to mind yeah. that receive stipends because of the unique situations in those departments. Well, it seems like there's always discussion at town meeting about stipends. It's people that question it all the time. I've never really understood it. A lot of times that has to deal with the police department because the way they do police <coughs> details, they're listed as stipends and not part of... It's grouped. Yeah. It's grouped. It's grouped as yeah. stipends. Yeah, so the stipend line for police is their police details, their actual stipends for their degrees and other training and so forth, but it's all lumped in with all those police <coughs> details also. So when they're out uh, working a construction it's compensation, site. but it's different right. streams. It's all lumped together, but it's called stipends. But if I may, Mr. Chairman, essentially that's more for unions than, yeah. you know, we're yeah. dealing right. with right. non-union. We did have a situation this year where there was so much uh, building going on to have a project manager that one of the individuals who was certified to be able to do that in staff took on that extra role and received a stipend, but that's discontinued now that the that the, uh, the, the, the projects are done, it was for a particular, and we save money by not having to go out and hire a third party to come in and do that. And so who can approve the stipends? How many? Who approves them? Personnel, Personnel board, board and the selectmen. Personnel board is involved it's in determining. Yes. So, so somebody just can't give a stipend without the personnel board voting in favor of it? Yes. Um, Susan? Thank you, Al. Just to clarify on stipends, and it's got nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight, but in the, in the annual report, so somebody who works at the high school may be a coach mm -hmm. who will get a stipend. So it's, a lot of times stipends are for above and beyond. It's, your, it's not yeah. your job. You're taking on something else. You get a stipend for doing that. So 
a whole host of reasons why somebody gets a stipend, but the group we're dealing with tonight. That's, that's right. I, also wanted, yeah. I just want to mention, yeah. too, like the survey was just comparing the base salaries. Yeah. That's what I thought. For the baselines mm -hmm. for the job, correct. Because there's so in few in the non-union that get stipends, you right. know, for a rare event. To okay. okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I think Mike's yeah. question sort of raised it for me. No, no I understand. Thank you. Going back to the uh, towns, who chooses the towns? Does uh, MMA or does the MMA? With we added a couple of towns, yeah, this, towns to this, this year, just to mm -hmm. address some questions about those two. Doug first, and Brian. Al. Um, on the hourly schedule, the second to last page mentions call firefighters. Second to last page of the hourly schedule. Oh, oh, oh the person, the bylaws? Yeah. Okay. 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 Just mentions call firefighters. I, do we still have those? I don't know. That's, that's one that comes yeah. to mind? Is it one? I don't know if you heard that. He's, the chief said that this one that's inactive. So as that person, you know, if they remain inactive, do we remove that position from the schedule? Does it stay on the schedule? Uh, it'll stay on the schedule to <coughs> give the town the flexibility in the event that the town wants to go back to. There's some, in fact, if you look at the entire package, the entire plan, there's some positions within the budget that are vacant. We keep them on a schedule to allow the flexibility to be able to do that. And actually, one position that I have in mind is actually, I don't know if the committee's met John Charbonneau yet. He's the community planning director. You'll notice that over the past few years, there's been some iteration of his position that's come up. Um, it started with Stephanie Mercandetti's position a couple of years ago as the community and economic developer. And then I think grants was added to the title, and then was community development director, and now community planning director. So all those positions still stayed on the schedule to allow the town the flexibility to go back to those positions should it become, but those positions aren't funded. Thanks. Just yes. curious, um, about adding positions to the, um, the numbers here. What, what I'm wondering is, for instance, I've heard Jim mention before, like you, you couldn't find two part-time people to do something, so you created a full-time position. Who has the authority to add pension and health care positions to uh, it's, the payroll? It's part of a process, so I'm not sure it's specifically what example you might be referring to. Well, what I'm wondering is, so we have so many employees yep. and that we're paying pension and, and health care benefits. And so my concern is, you know, God bless them, they've worked for 30 years, they retire, and, you know, they're on the pension and the health care for another 30 years. So one of the things that I'm a little bit concerned about with the town is you can't find part-timers, very challenging, so the, a, a full-time position is created. And so now we've brought on someone full-time and then we incur the, their retirement and health care benefits. Or you can't use subcontractors. So one of the things I'm wondering about is when the town looks at personnel needs, do they say, well, let's just create another position, another whatever position it may be, and it's a full-time employee versus going out and saying, can this position be broken down and brought, bring in a subcontractor or bring in a part-timer so that the town doesn't incur that pension and health care liability down the road? Sure. I'm, I'm not certain if, if there's a specific example you might be referring to. I know that with, you know, specifically some of the new positions that have been added with this budget, you know, that, that is a constant consideration. And, you know, I'm thinking right now of, when Jim and I were kind of going back and forth with some of the position, well, with this new position with the Council on Aging that would be shared with the, the Veterans Department, you know, we were looking at, okay, what is what does this new building need? And, you know, as much as we, you know, there was a, a full-time, we'd love to see more full-time employees right there. That was a constant need, you know, and I'm thinking actually specifically of kind of the van drivers. Um, you know, as you can imagine, their, <coughs> their averages per day, Josette, you know, are, are increased dramatically so to be able to you know provide those transportation services to an increased number of uh, clientele is continuing to put a burden on that department so you know that's one example I can think of where you know you've got to uh, you've got to you know weigh those the, right. the costs actually Patrick that. now that I'm got my thought a little bit so who has the authority to add a full-time position full-time employee to the payroll within the 
town of Walpole. So it's a process. If you so select it and approve it, starts or at the department level who submitted budget request to the town administrator, then ultimately he turns that, that budget over to this committee to make a re recommendation to town meeting. So it's a, you know, it starts at the department level, goes to the town administrator, and then and then to. So the it actually side. goes to the the RTM to decide whether they're going to approve <coughs> to bring on another full time position. Okay. And then Jim, you know, I'm sure this committee knows it's, it's a balancing act to try to. You know, fit the myriad of department requests into you know the revenue structure that the town has. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Uh, let's take the <coughs> articles individually. We can vote these. Um, as we said we would have votes on our agenda. Uh, Article two, which is um, the renumbering of the bylaws. Proposed favorable action. Susan. Favorable action. Seconded by Denny. <coughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 14 0. <coughs> Article 3, which is the new salary schedule, uh, which is basically a 2% increase um, over last year's schedule. A move favorable action. Moved by Susan, seconded by Denny. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? I'm abstaining. Okay. Kathleen and I abstained. Right, so it's 12 zero, 2 Yep. And Article 4 uh, is basically no action because the money is already in the budget. So. Motion for no action. Susan, no action. Seconded by Denny. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 14 is good. 13. So you can abstain on 4. No 13 zero. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. DiNapoli just called to my attention. There's just a couple items that in Article Three. I just want to make sure that you know that was included in um, okay. you know in the, the committee's consideration, namely the two percent increase, which I know you mentioned. Mm -hmm. There's also the new position for the deputy building commissioner, uh, the recreation schedule, okay. and uh, eliminating the mid mid back schedule. So that's all included in that as well. What was the last thing? In eliminating the mid mid oh, mid right. mid mid back <laughs> schedule. It's not just, no, it's not just <laughs> don't say it fast. Oh, okay. I just wanted to make that clear. The yep. three M's. Yes, yeah, that's we'll, right. we'll yeah. clarify yeah. that in the notes. And that's the last time we'll get mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Put that one to rest. Why we eliminated. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 All of that. Okay. Uh, no, that was Article Three. Article Three. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. So. Okay. Appreciate Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Nice job, Mr. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the next item on the agenda is the uh, annual Walpole Media Corporation budget. I know the gentleman from Walpole Media are here, uh, Mr. Krause, the chairman of the board. Uh, we can get right into it, I guess. Yeah, sure. Greetings, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the FinCom. It's great to be here. In your packets, you'll have our fiscal year 2020 budget, which is for the second year in a row uh, level funded. So we are not increasing it this year over last year. It's a budget of $463,787 for our operations and a capital budget of uh, $57,483. Um, our primary goal, because I know each one of you watches Walpole Media on an hourly basis, <laughs> um, is to return to full-time staffing We've taken a Band-Aid approach since our program director and executive director left this year. Um, and we've used a lot of, uh, for lack of better words, smoke and mirrors to make sure that we have a steady stream of each of the three legs of the stool, public, uh, educational, and government. But we have to get full time because we cannot continue. And that's reflected in the budget. We made uh, other provisions to make sure we came in level uh, flat over last year. Um, I think when we look to where we're going as an organization, I think we do a good job covering the government side of the three-legged stool. I think we do a good job partnering with the school and covering activities, sports. Um, at the school level, I really want to see an uptick on the public level. Uh, other peer towns in this area do a, a heck of a lot more. Uh, allowing people to come in, edit shows, run additional programming, and uh, that's what we're going to be focusing on once we have the staff. And then aspirationally, I just think there's a tremendous opportunity to make Walpole Media into a media organization. 
um, given the demise of our local newspapers and having news on a local level available aspirationally we're going to look to beef up the presence both uh, on our web as well as in the programming that you see so that is all reflected and I think we're uh, off to a good start and can accomplish what we want with the flat budget we're presenting Questions? sir can you explain um, what the, the payroll staff is now and then the and how that relates to the insurance employee health insurance we do not have a full-time employee right now our executive director left five and a half months ago and we uh, and his number two left before that so right now mm -hmm. we are using um, Pete O'Farrell uh, on a temporary basis with him above and beyond his duties mm -hmm. to be an ad hoc interim program manager but we are soliciting using a professional recruiting firm right now uh, candidates to be executive director at the somewhere between the seventy and ninety five thousand dollar range which is par for the job compared with the community research we've done but and the then insurance insurance obviously plays off of that right We're using the, the payroll staff is two hundred and eighteen thousand and so what does that consist of three people is what the budget reflects it'll be an executive director <coughs> That person's responsibilities will be the business end and the HR end of running the station or the media outlet. The second job would be a program manager, someone the nuts and bolts of making sure we have programming both on the web and, and on television. And then the third person would be a junior person underneath that. Complementing those three full-time people, we have a stable of students that we pay students that we don't pay and then freelancers to make sure that we have constant programming and these three people are you're hiring them we're hiring them first we're going to hire the executive director mm -hmm. um, and I really am from the camp that I want that person uh, he or she to hire the staff that he or she is going to be responsible for mm -hmm. and this is a very small operation and you know Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Is the junior staff member also full time? Uh, that's what we're going to plan on. But I mean, we have two hundred eighteen thousand right. dollars, and we have to see what those first two jobs bring, and then we're going to use uh, external resources. First of all, great job. I think Walpole Media TV is a huge resource for the community. It's extremely important that we have these uh, videos and other content uh, online. So. Um, that's my first point, and I, I understand you've been understaffed and uh, fully supportive of this budget to hire the program director, the executive director, and the junior person. Uh, and the folks like Patrick, who do, I think, a great job filling the, the void here these last few months have been huge. One of the things, so this is my first question, one of the things I've noticed is, um, and there's a good, very good explanation for this, I bet, because of understaffing, but the, the Walpole Media YouTube channel mm -hmm. hasn't had videos added to it recently. And one of the conversations I've had, I believe it was Pat with Patrick or maybe someone else in the past, is that only certain rooms, uh, namely the, the main town me hall meeting room, right. are equipped with the ability to live stream meetings on, on YouTube. Is there anything in the capital plan, here's my question, is there anything in the capital plan here to expand that to this room or the library to have the kind of mobile ability to film, not just film an event, a, a government meeting, but have it be, people can watch it in, in real time. So this is what we've done. We've equipped the new main hall at the Senior Center, at the Walpole Co-op, Co uh, South Street Center. Um, <laughs> the Richard Stillman room at the police station. Um, the main room, which is down because of the uh, pipe bursting and all of that. We use fly packs in this type for this meeting here, but given where we are with capital i'd love every single room to have the ability to live stream and right now it's a prioritization andrew and you know what we're doing the best we can but once we're fully staffed that's going to be a major effort so and one of the things that we have done an okay job with but will continue to do a better job with is partnering with the journalism and the film um, classes at the high school that is an incredible group of laborers if you will people that want to learn this and can do that and quite frankly i think a year from now 
if we don't merge their effort and some of the great work they're doing with the rebellion. I mean, it's uh, uh, duplicative to what we're trying to do. I can see a, a, an effort where you see a combination of both, and we've already begun those conversations with the school. Susan? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, any chance that the um, high school film festival will be televised? We, we do run the uh, entries, and, but it's not real time. So what is it? Yeah. They, um, they use that as a source of revenue. They right. sell their DVDs <laughs> and, and so forth. Oh, they do? And yeah. They, yes, yeah. Yeah, it's a major source of revenue. And they sell them going back historically. You can purchase them up to something like six or seven years back. They do post some of them on their own uh, on their own website, but it's after a significant number of years before they do. And we've asked. So, yeah, it's like five I think years. people, it's great work, and you want to show <coughs> what the kids are doing. There's so much excitement around that. Mm -hmm. That's the single biggest thing that the high school does from from that effort, and we'd love to do it. We've just we get it piecemeal. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The um, professional recruiting company that you're, you have hired, or will, mm -hmm. you have hired? Uh, we see them at our monthly meeting on Wednesday to retain them. Okay, so you're going to be hiring them. Is there a, t I don't know how this works, so is there a time frame that within a specified 60, 90 days they bring, yeah, that's how bring, it's set up? What we will ask for is four quality candidates. <coughs> our board will interview those and select one. Uh, if we don't have a full-time director in the next 60 days, we'll be criminal because we're just, we're doing the best we can. Okay, thank you. Richard? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Eric, I didn't know you were even taking this position until about a week ago when Jim mentioned it, so maybe you could kind of explain what's been going on with the media. Also, I didn't realize how much I had come to depend on watching planning board meetings and seeing Joe and Jack with their show with. I knew who he was, but I wasn't sure till tonight uh, that the programming is not available right now. It's just real hard to get it. Are you putting enough capital in here now to solve some of the problems for equipment? First capital is the human asset. Which is yeah, you need that necessary, but yes, uh, and you will see a major uptick, especially on the public leg, um, which all of this programming outside of government and school is what you got. But by, by way of background, um, it had to have been six, no, eight years ago. We the selectmen took over Walpole Cable Television for a number of reasons not the least of which was uh, shoddy financial um, reporting. And when we took it over, I was not a selectman, it was my off year at the time. I uh, was president of the working group that created Walpole Media. Then I had uh, six years of being a selectman and now that I've stepped down doing that, uh, I was asked to come back in and, and join something that is just a personal passion of mine. So I think um, you're well suited yeah. for it. And um, it's, yeah, we want the best community television, the best community outlet. We just right now um, are doing the best we can with what we have to get at least government in school. But there are a handful of shows that are on that I'd encourage people to watch because some of them are, are very interesting. And if you have a desire to run a TV show, that's what we want. We want the public to do that. <coughs> <clears throat> but with the resources we have, we can't cover everything, and we prioritize it this time, Dick. Yeah, I find the uh, government portion of it pretty valuable. Yeah. We, you could sit and you know, watch some of these meetings right. from home. Well, you can go on the website and get everything if you want to stream. Some of it is not live. If you want live, you go to YouTube. Yeah. But Well, I think, Patrick, somebody Patrick here talked me into signing up for a YouTube yep. channel, and I'm on there, but... <laughs> I got really frustrated <laughs> the other night trying to catch Joe and them on the planning board with I was the, there and I was frustrated field. catching Joe. <laughs> Joe. Joe should have his own program, I think, <laughs> when he retires. Yeah, please. Sure. Jim, uh, but just, just to clarify some Jim, Jim, For those that you don't know, Jim DeTilio, uh, and was in my working group when we started. He is the school committee appointee to Walpole Media. 
He has been involved in this from day one and is probably the most knowledgeable person in town on this. So, Jim, do you want to come up with the mic? Want to come up? Certainly. Um, the, uh, just to clarify some of the live broadcasts, live streaming, part of the reason that it, not as much is happening is the primary way that live streaming occurs and a lot of the, even the YouTube channel and so forth, is uploaded automatically when things are being live broadcast. With the selectmen's meeting room down, that ability has been lost. So things can be live, things, are, they can't be live streamed necessarily in most of the other locations at the moment. They do get up there eventually into YouTube, but now it has to be hand carried, hand uploaded back at the studio, that sort of stuff. It's much more labor intensive. Uh, when the uh, when that room is in, is functioning and we can live broadcast, it just automatically goes out as part of that. It's uh, multiple on YouTube, steps fewer. It's live. Yes, that's what I thought, yes. but I could so never figure it out. A major chunk of the down yeah, time on that is because of that. So. Maybe I had so. gotten it right and, and it just wasn't labor there. Intensive now until yeah. that's back up and running. Yeah. Now, are they able to? provide you with equipment that's portable that you could get to move around? Yeah, we do. That do, the, do we have a lot of that now? Uh, we have uh, three fly packs, for example. Uh, we have this one. We have the one down at the high school, which isn't really mobile. Uh, we'll get yeah, also have yeah, no, that's, I think it's good that you're there. I mean, you've got the, <coughs> you've got the political background plus the business. Your yep. business is strong. Yeah, we're do, we, we are trying. And as I said, the, the nice thing that we're doing <coughs> is we have a stable of high schoolers that are doing terrific work with us, and they're learning at the same time. Oh, yeah, no, they were. Yeah. Well. No, thank you. I'm glad you're aboard. On the capital side, is this exclusively for Walpole Media's studio, or is some of this being shared with the high school program also? Well, because we had, <coughs> because we've been in the situation um, of not having full-time employees, one of the things we're doing right now is paying for new LED lighting in the high school auditorium. For those of you who watch town <coughs> meeting or even attend town meeting, the lighting is horrific, and our coverage uh, subsequently is even more horrific of, of there. So our biggest capital expenditure this year is new lights there. Mm -hmm. We also want to put a studio in at one of the two middle schools and get <coughs> students very early engaged in this. Um, so those are really the two largest items right now. Our studio at the high school is well suited. Uh, we'll make minor enhancements, but our capital budget of $57,000 reflects all of that. And then to the point that was brought up, we are making improvements to each of the current locations where we can broadcast. And once we're up to speed with decent equipment, we really can't get the best of the best, but we want decent <coughs> equipment. We'll look to subsequent locations, so we're well wired. But that's what the plan is for capital. Jim, I, yeah, I can point out. If, are you referring to this sheet? The, yeah. This, yeah. Uh, most of this is not uh, <coughs> studio related. Okay. Yeah, please. Most of it is not studio related. You can see the one studio one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Patrick loves me. <laughs> uh, field equipment. That is primarily things that are going to go in the van to be transported around town where needed, such as to augment here, to augment at. Uh, the police station, et cetera, to make it more portable. <coughs> uh, the archival upgrade is, that's actually not, that's uh, part of it's the studio and it's going to provide a secondary location. Uh, much of our stuff is, is being stored on a NAS server and this is going to make it possible to double the capacity of the NAS server because it's almost full after the last five years, four years. Uh, and it's also going to place a secondary backup one for disaster recovery, which will probably be located in the emergency rack over at uh, Elm Street School. You can see the one COA. This is a couple of additional items to make the broadcasting from there a little more uh, uh, bulletproof. Uh, those were some things that weren't originally included. We're going to add to it just to make that possible and of course the bottom is all truck upgrades the truck was built some number of years ago before our committee took possession of it and much of it is now outdated this is going to make it uh, more easily uh, workable for a greater number of people 
and also make it easier to act, augment live broadcast from different locations. So in, in, addition, in addition, we're only adding a handful of miles annually on the <laughs> truck because it stays here, mm -hmm. and that has given us a host of mechanical issues. That we're addressing as well. It only has 1,700 miles on it. Mm -hmm. so. And the truck's what, 10 years old? It's seven years yeah. old, eight years old. <laughs> but it, uh, you know, you have to maintain it as though it, when a year goes by, you still have to maintain it as though it drove the max. So, yeah. so that, that, that's, that's our plan from a capital perspective. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I just want to be clear, make sure the Finance Committee understands this money does not come out of our taxes. It is, right. maybe Eric, you could explain to me. Actually, it's all, all of our money yeah. right. because uh, for lack of a, a precise percentage, 3% of your Comcast, your Verizon bill, Verizon and Comcast gives back to us. Mm -hmm. So this has nothing to do with the town's budget. And before we took over, and it was Walpole Cable Television, really the, the town administrator had nothing to do with it. One of the first things my committee did was take control, have the town take control over the money because of the um, interesting financial accounting practices that that organization had <laughs> and one of the stipulations for us going forward was that the town would be the steward and the police for that money and I, I think it's a good thing to have a check and balance in place um, but this isn't asking for funds um, God forbid that ever happens this is all of our money and uh, that's why we're in a little different situation because 3% of your bill or 2.7% is, is fueling this. I just wanted everyone to yeah, understand. That's a very valid yeah, point. I'm sorry for not bringing it up. So are the funds restricted? So yes. it has yes. to be spent. Yeah. On yeah. Yeah. It's got to be spent yeah. through so the It has to be banks. spent on you guys. Right. Okay. Well, no, it has to be spent on each of those three legs. So, I mean, I couldn't get right at. Right. And, 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 we, yeah. we can't right. divert it to something yeah. else. No. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. I, I, you know what? And there's some years I wish we could, yes. especially mm -hmm. in my former life. Mm -hmm. You know, you see the trouble we have and the choices that FinCom and the selectmen make. We would love to be able to help out, but you can't. You, mm -hmm. you know, okay. um, you, you really can't. Yeah, the, the line on your bill is the PEG, so it's the right. Public Educational right. and Government yeah, no, Grant no. Program that Verizon and Comcast pay back to the town on a quarterly basis. Now, there basis. is, if you Google this, probably the most upsetting and troubling is the cable companies philosophically are going to try to fight back and wipe out any contribution to towns. We don't necessarily, like our brother and sister towns, think that's going to happen anytime soon, but there is an undercurrent by the cable companies now that sometime in the distant future that that funding is going to go away. At that point, <coughs> we hope to have a really sophisticated system and we would look to advertising and other means to raise money to keep it going. Mm -hmm. But um, for the time being, the town really doesn't give us anything and we're partnering with the school for the space and I'm pretty positive on where we are right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Eric, uh, these are the expenses. Does the uh, agency, I mean, so it's a nonprofit corporation. Mm -hmm. So does it have a fund balance? So, you, you know, there is a reserve. It yeah. does. And, it, and is, yeah, you try to. include in the packet, that's too. included yeah, in I didn't see it. You look at yeah. the memo that I didn't see it. provided last week. Um, yeah, maybe it was last week. It's a million dollars. It's a million dollars. It actually breaks down the revenue stream uh, for the past this week. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll so check the million dollars in the fund. That we collectively have a million dollars yeah. in the fund and we ask for this amount I of money. Sixty three. Yeah. So so there's reserve. A absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. And yeah. that's why we're able at times to do things like spend the money to replace the lighting at the yeah. high school, which you might say, why is cable doing that? Well, look at okay. the coverage of town meeting and you'll understand. Mm -hmm. On that same point, I mean, I can only speak for myself sitting up front. I can't speak for Mark, but the good lighting may not be beneficial. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you want people to look at yeah. the town meeting. And yeah. It's not a good thing. Yeah, Eric, with, with um, streaming and Netflix yeah, yeah. and Sling and Hulu, 
Has there been a hit to mm -hmm. that 2.7 percent you're receiving from? No, but the, that is that's the year what, what, what their thinking. basis is. What was that with Jim's? Because I mean, if you think of it, television has changed dramatically in the last five years. I mean, it's just nothing like we all grew up watching. And uh, with what you can do on your computer and what you can do so, with what was that with what services, he gave us like, today? Like Hulu and Netflix That's March and then, 6th. Uh, Roku and Sling and all of that. It's just a different animal right now. But it, we're, we're going to ride it as long as we possibly can in, with the funding that we're getting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Yes, Richard. This is a little side note, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was upgrading my cable. I didn't know whether to go with Fios or Comcast, and I called the lady at Fios because I have them. And uh, as much as Joe's been telling me about all the planning board meetings and all this stuff that's on there, I said, well, what would be the best plan for me? And they said, oh, we'll tell you. So they said, well, you've been watching Peg. And I said, who the hell's Peg? You <laughs> 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 have to find out. It's Chief Carmichael, it's yeah. uh, Joe and Jack. Yeah. We're still looking for pegs. <laughs> so they know exactly how many hours you do online with everything you're doing at home. Mm -hmm. So they said, no, it's your public access. So it was good to have that. Anyway. Do I have a motion? Let's see, my daughter says. I move to the motion. When I talk to Seconded by Denny. Seconded. And the favorable action for the full budget, including capital of four sixty three seven zero seven eighty cents. That eighty cents. Yes. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. Hey, thank you very much. Fourteen zero zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. All right, so that just leaves Articles 18, 19, 20, and 21, which are the planning articles. I'd <laughs> like to call up uh, John Schauber, the Community Planning Director, and give an overview of each of these. Um, article 18, Mullins Rule. Article 19 is an article regulating vape shops in Walpole. And then uh, two articles on AQV, so. Huh? Thank you. Welcome, John. Thank you. Article 18 is something that's been accepted by, from what I understand, other boards in town. It's also been accepted by pretty much every regulatory board and other towns I've worked for. Um, without the Mullins rule and what currently exists with the planning board is when they have a public hearing on a project, especially when a project goes on for five, six more public hearings, um, if a member of the planning board, a voting member, misses a single public hearing, they are eliminated from voting at the end of the process. And this can become an issue. Like I said, when a project goes on for a while, and especially when it's a special permit where a supermajority is needed, two-thirds vote, um, you know, boards like to have an applicant keep the maximum voting quorum possible throughout the public hearing. It's to their benefit and it's to the town's benefit. So by adopting the Mullen rule, it would allow um, any of the board members to miss one public hearing during that process. And as long as they sign an affidavit verifying that they've caught up on the relevant material presented and testimony given at that public hearing and the board agrees to it and the applicant agrees to it, they can still vote at the end of the process. Um, so like I said, I, you know, this was a, it, it was discussed a few times with the planning board and there was some back and forth on it, but the planning board has uh, agreed to put this forward and um, I think it's a good thing. I've seen it come in handy in other places I've worked, especially not only when a public hearing goes on a long time, but um, when there's turnover with the board as well, when you come up on an election, for instance, and you have changes in the board, it can, it can benefit the applicant to allow them to have a voting quorum at the end, where otherwise they may have to withdraw and start the process over again. Susan? Hey, Mr. Chairman, um, I strongly support this. Um, I think we in FinCom know the pain that ensues when there's a, you don't have a quorum or there's an issue with um, people being present for meetings. So. The one thing you don't want to have is a huge waste of time, which is money. Um, so I think this is sensible. I see that it's restricted to one. So um, I think it's a, a, a good proposal. Happy to see it. It's reasonable because obviously you're all volunteers. These boards are volunteers and life happens. Right. And you, it's not always possible to be, to be at every single meeting. So it gives that accommodation. 
Richard? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Andrew, are you taking the notes? No. Just that is. Oh, Just that is. Okay. Let it be noted, I agree with Susan on this 100%. <laughs> uh, we've been trying to get that for the last 10 years. I think it's the right direction to go, and uh, I'm behind it 100%. Other questions? Yes. So, I'm curious how board members and the applicant agree that the individual who misses the meeting can hmm. reasonably educate themselves. What's the process for that? Do they just? It's just discussed. It's, it's similar to a disclosure of a conflict of interest where if a planning board member or another board member has a potential conflict of interest, they can disclose it. And then the board and the applicant at, that, at the public hearing discuss whether or not they feel comfortable going forward or they think it's a conflict of interest. It's similar where you know, the, the member discloses that he's going to enact the Mullins rule, sign the affidavit, and basically, you know, the applicant at, at that meeting says, yep, we don't have a problem with that. And it's, 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 a, it's a fairly informal thing when it comes to that. That's what I assumed. I was just seemed odd. Yeah, and now with the, with, um, you know, obviously video becoming available, it makes it a lot easier for a member to catch up and actually see what happened rather than just hearing it. Thank you. Has the planning board ever used a remote in this day and age with technology? I travel a lot for work, yeah. and sometimes I have to call in. So is the, can the planning board call into a meeting? Not at this point. They don't have that capability yet. Um, Patrick, has, has that been a town-wide discussion? No, it, I think for the most part it's been done on an ad hoc basis with the boards and committees. So I think that that's a provision that the finance committee has adopted as well as the board of selectmen. Uh, the planning board hasn't hasn't adopted that, and it's it's done on a board and committee uh, basis. So, might be something might yeah. Yeah. to look into this day and age. You might get more people that might want to help and serve on the committee if they travel for work. Yeah, I know that. Um, I I was in Rentham previous to this, and the selectmen adopted the remote participation policy. And at the time coming to Walpole, the planning board there has had started to discuss that possibility because there was there's a certain member of the planning board who he's retired and he and he goes to San Diego to visit his uh, his daughter for a few months out of the year so it would allow him to you know kind of Skype in or face uh, FaceTime in on meetings so I know the planning board had discussed adopting that so it's something more and more boards and towns are looking into so definitely I think that will be a point of discussion in the near future Ron? Uh, I guess my question is to, to Joe has the planning board voted on this yet Joe they have? Yes. Yes, it was a 5-0-0 um, zero, zero vote okay. to put it on. This, um, it's taken three years to get this approved since I've been on the uh, planning board. And uh, the reason that it has never been approved in the past is because some past planning board members did not want to accept this uh, statute. Uh, and the reason being is that they thought that because they were elected officials that they were held to a higher standard and they should be present at all meetings. Uh, with respect to remote, I doubt that that's something that's going to happen because let's take the Siemens project for instance. It was, um, you know, those big rolled up papers that are huge and can barely fit on this desk there were 186 pages of drawings on there. So uh, to take that with you to San Diego uh, and try to dial in remote and be able to communicate with other planning board members would be kind of difficult. Um, one of the things that uh, you need to know about this article is that um, when you, the one meeting that you miss you can either read the minutes or watch it on video or listen to it on audio. Those are the three ways you usually can make up the session. But then you need to sign an affidavit indicating that, you know, when you did it, what you did, how you did it, signed it, and it goes into the file. If you miss a second meeting, uh, that's it, you're over. Now, um, uh, the planning board attendance, I don't want you to think that, you know, we're doing this because of that, but the planning board attendance is actually very good. I know in my own situation, I've missed two meetings in three years, and one because of illness, 
in December of last, or two years ago, and one because I was on a trip. Um, and um, the one that I was on a trip for, uh, Katie Turco missed a meeting on that public hearing as well, and that was on 1350 North Street. So I'll give you the dilemma that now occurs. Only three, because we don't have the Mullen Rule, only three members can now vote on 1350 North Street on that site plan review, a very controversial site plan application that's been going on now for a, over about a year, if not a year. So um, they need all three members to vote in favor of that site plan, otherwise it doesn't pass. So if two vote in favor and one is against, it does not pass. And that's Dover Amendment. The applicant is invoking the Dover Amendment, which makes it even more difficult. Um, you're walking a fine line there. So um, you need unanimity to get to go forward. So um, that's pr pretty much why I've been pushing this um, Do Mullen Rule for quite a long time, but it's uh, just coming about now, I think uh, well, everyone agrees that it is uh, beyond its time. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman. Joe, sorry, one <coughs> more question for you. Is five the right number for the planning board? Yes, five is the, what's in the charter, five members of the planning board, five, five, um, but there are planning boards in other towns who take on an associate member. Um, I think Norwood has an associate member, uh, non-voting, but uh, comes yeah. to the um, uh, meetings and, and can ask questions, but just cannot vote. It's sort of like an associate member on the ZBA. And it's a, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because that was something in the back of my mind, but it just hasn't come, moved to the front of the priority list because it's a great way for somebody who has an interest in being on the planning board to sort of come and, and be a, uh, and get involved and review the plans and see exactly what it, it is like. A lot of people, I know Ron does not like zoning. <laughs> uh, he has said it <laughs> many Just times at a meeting that it gives him a terrible headache when zoning articles uh, come forward at town meeting and a lot of people um, it's hard for people to understand zoning because unless you are working with the zoning bylaw periodically consistently you're never going to understand it now there are sections in the zoning bylaw that uh, I have not even uh, not even come to my attention so I would never have the knowledge of that particular section of the zoning bylaw. Most of our work is site plan review and um, subdivisions, uh, and occasional we have AQVs, which well, you'll see uh, a couple amendments being suggested this time. Um, so it's a, a very difficult process to understand when you first take a look at the 186-page zoning bylaw. You get taken aback. Back in the 1970s. Uh, the zoning bylaw book was 20-something pages long. See how it's grown over the years and how more encompassing because as you start to find more problems, you start to write more amendments and the zoning bylaws continues to grow. So um, it is very uh, daunting uh, and site planning is often one of the most uh, things that are hard to understand uh, because uh, as an outsider because uh, there are a lot of information that a zoning board acquires from an applicant who's coming in on a project and one of them is uh, one aspect of the site plan review is a development impact statement where the zoning uh, where the planning board is actually acquiring a lot of information from the applicant about the cost of his project and how a cost it will be to the town of Walpole. For instance, on the apartments here in the center of town, Corcoran, um, uh, the one that's building on West Street, 
submitted a development impact statement and a fiscal analysis that was this thick, and it included it, you know, how it affected the police department, the fire department, the schools, how many children will be coming into the school system, projected amounts, and how much it will cost versus how much they are going to pay in taxes and excise taxes, <coughs> infiltration, all that financial sheet is there. It's sort of what the FinCom does at the back end, we're doing at the front end. And then we share that information with the various departments in town. So site plan is very, very encompassing and um, more, I think more encompassing than say a subdivision, um, doing an actual subdivision. Thank you. You answered my question very thoroughly. I would say that <laughs> we certainly do need the, the Mullen um, yeah, the amendment to reduce the pressure on the people who have read these huge documents and then they can't make a meeting yeah. and then their, their qualifications are, are no longer valuable. But it also just seems to me that if there were more people on the board, I mean, it's not hard for us to achieve a quorum here on FinCom, even with you know, two or three people absent. And it seems like we're asking a lot of the planning board to carry all that weight on something as important as 1350 North Street and then only have it come down to the decision of three people, I, I feel. I mean, I understand it's in the charter, it's for five, but in my mind, that's an awfully small number of people to have so much responsibility. Well, if you'd had this, you wouldn't have that problem. Right. It yeah. fixes it. Can I just ask one question? Sure. That plan that they submitted, the impact on fire and police, did it talk about the impact of trying to take a left-hand turn out of the railroad <laughs> station? No, as a matter of fact, um, yes. <laughs> one of the things about the two apartments in the center of town, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals was really the go-to authority. They granted, they had the responsibility of granting the special permit. And the special permit says you can do those apartments site plan, which was under the author simultaneous authority of the planning board is, okay, where are you going to park your cars? Where are you going to put your snow? You know, how far are you going to be, uh, you know, from the street or whatever? Why don't we have a set of lights here? Um, you know, then you start trying to mitigate some of the problems you're basically, as a planning board member with a site plan in front of you, the law requires you to shape a plan, not deny it. And there's a lot of legal cases to support that, even cases, I believe, that go up to the Mass Supreme Court. So you really cannot say, I don't, you better have a real good reason to <coughs> deny a site plan. It has to, I think the law says it has to be untenable. And how it defines untenable, no one really knows, but you better be able to defend why you're denying the site plan. I apologize. I didn't mean to take us yeah. off, off uh, subject. <laughs> Would you entertain a motion? Sure. I'd like to make a motion to approve the acceptance of the Mullen Rule. Second. As written. Thank Which you, Susan. Second by Susan. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Favorable action, I think you mean. Hypothetical. Favorable yeah, action. Favorable yeah, action. I always leave that out. I didn't. I always mean We know what he meant. Okay. Everybody knows. Um, I have a question on this. <laughs> the fact is that this is hypothetically for the one person. Is there any way this can be abused? Can, are they, is in an individual on a specific board, your board, um, can they only use this once during the course? Is there a time? It can be abused once per public hearing. Per public hearing, right. period. Right. Period. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Okay. No other questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, abstain? 14 0 As It has nothing germane to that article, okay. but what Joe raised and Patrick maybe, uh, well, it's, I'd like to see some of those summer, and not that, I don't want to see a whole book, Joe. <laughs> I, I know you like the big books, I don't. But at least on this, on the planning stuff. But what you mentioned, and especially with all the big projects we have going on, yeah. uh, and some of the discussions that we're having with our budgets, that we might have some funds in talking about fire and police, it would help us to see what these projected sites are saying for, for public safety, for school and things like that. Uh, it would be helpful for some of our decisions. So mm -hmm. if, uh, yeah. 
if some, people some applicants it, put together a very complete package because they hire a consultant to do right. it. Others, um, it's not as complete. Let's put it that way. Well, I mean, you just have to draw it out of them during the hearing. Right. Whatever we have, I mean, I'm sure, like you say, Cochran has one. I'm sure Pulte must have one. Uh, and uh, I don't know who the developer is in Delapa, but some of them, are just, whatever we have will, would be yeah. better than what we have right now. <clears throat> so you have another, bar, another, not saying independent, but outside of it, especially within the town, saying this is what they believe. Yeah, so it would be helpful for Jim us. Jim and John, before we, I know you committee scheduled to meet with the chiefs this upcoming Thursday. Yeah. We, can, yeah. we can try to assemble some, be, some information for those projects. Yeah. So you must okay. yeah, all right. That's very good. All right, uh, so Article 19, this is the article from the petition from the Board of Selectmen uh, regulating vape shops in the town of Walpole. Yeah, so this, um, I was asked to prepare this amendment. It wasn't my suggestion, my idea. Um, it's, a, it's a simple one where <coughs> it would add vape shops as an allowed use by special permit through the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Industrial Zoning District within our use table as a business use. And it would also add a definition into Article 14 definitions put in its proper location. The idea being that um, this is a very trendy thing now. It's exploding all over the place. And there are all sorts of health risks and negative health effects. So it's an effort to kind of make sure that the town of Walpole doesn't become a town known for vape shops. So it doesn't affect the two that are here now. It just simply regulates those going forward. Now, I know that um, there is, I think that one of the abutting towns has, um, I believe it's Norwood has, um, they've actually capped the number of vape shops oh, okay. at 10, similar to, similar to liquor licenses. Now that would be a Board of Selectmen decision to do that, but this at least would put the mechanism in place to kind of control uh, vape shops for the time being until that's potentially discussed by the selectmen. So um, it's a fairly simple regulation to make sure that these don't come flooding in uncontrollably and um, put some kind of regulation on them. Okay. How does it control it? That's well, because it can only go into our industrial zoning district through special permit, which has to meet certain thresholds that are much stricter than site plan approval, as Joe explained. Mm -hmm. Special permit has a special permit is. The thresholds are stricter, so uh, special permits are more defensible when they're denied on appeal. Site plan <coughs> approvals are almost never overturned on appeal if they're denied, so um, it's a more rigorous uh, process to go through with a special permit. It limits any. Oh, I was just saying, I would, I would just add on that. So right now, uh, to, to commercial use, it's a lot by right. So mm -hmm. after the two that opened up, uh, one in the center of town, one over by McMorgan's, after they opened up, we got a lot of outcry from the public. How how could you let this happen? Well, it's a commercial use. It's allowed. Yep. It's allowed by right. So this kind of, as John was saying, it puts in that extra step. So it wouldn't necessarily be allowed by right. Kathleen, thank you. I, I say I'm by no means pro vape shop, but I have a real problem when we start to piecemeal our zoning bylaws. Mm -hmm. I don't. I really don't want a cigar shop, and I don't want Adam and Eve, and I don't want a lot of things, mm -hmm. and I don't typically see myself as much of a free market economist, but really, <laughs> if we don't support these things and we don't go to them, don't they close up and go away? But that, yes, I, I agree with your general point. In fact, uh, one of the things that is gonna be, uh, we've started to put together processes to look at our zoning bylaws and do a comprehensive recodification. So I agree with you. Um, you know, um, over time, Zoning bylaws can get uh, fragmented patchwork, yeah. because patchwork because okay we don't we don't, you don't like that and what I'm trying what I'm trying to start to encourage people to think about as we go through this process is don't think about what you want to keep out think about what you want to allow in because yeah. I've seen all sorts of examples and again I, I'll use it because I was just recently there but Route One in Rentham what happened there was over the years they put in zoning districts to keep things out and now over 2.3 miles they have seven zoning districts over 2.3 miles and. Route 1 in Rentham is probably the ugliest part of Route 1 <laughs> that you go through. And so r during my time there, that we had a Route 1 corridor study done. And just when I was leaving there, they had started using the same consultant to do a rezoning of Route 1 because 
the one thing that people didn't want going on to Route 1 was junkyards. Well, what's the easiest thing to put onto Route 1 and rent them? A junkyard because of the, no the, the patchwork regulations. So when you, when you have the f mind frame of, okay, we want to keep this out, this is bad, and you framework your zoning bylaws by that, on the you know that uh, unintended consequences mm -hmm. you actually sometimes end up allowing and making it easier for the one thing you don't want to go in so I agree with your general point about doing um, doing a more comprehensive approach to zoning bylaws so uh, in your mind and I don't mean to put words in your mouth I did see your presentation the other day at the senior center and so that sort of informed my thought process but um, this is a stopgap and then we Redo right. I mean, <coughs> I mean, when when we take a, a look at the zoning bylaws as a whole, this may survive. It may not. We'll take a look at it. it may be rolled into something else. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball yet because we haven't started those discussions. But I, the other thing that is very difficult for towns to do is to be proactive because the private the private sector is always two steps ahead, and towns are always trying to keep up with what's going on in the public private sector. I mean, there are, there are bylaws in towns where they have antiquated uses that haven't been in existence for 30, 40 years. The town of Blackstone still has ice warehouses as a use in their zoning bylaws. There hasn't been an ice warehouse since probably the 1950s. So it's not uncommon for town zoning bylaws to be a little bit antiquated because, you know, again, you know, most people don't sp eat, drink, and breathe zoning bylaws. You go about your business and everything. So, um, you know, you know, so... I don't. Yeah, this this would be. Um, you don't see this if as approved, an that may that may survive a recodification. It may not. We'll we'll have that discussion when the time. But comes. doesn't present any obstacle certainly to you. Going no, down it doesn't. This do, this does not have a ripple effect on other sections of the bylaw. It does not prevent us from having a new discussion when the zoning bylaws are recodified in the future. And then Susan, then Andrew. Um, <coughs> don't mention that you know th these type of articles make my head hurt. And the reason being, I mean, Article 19, unless you go into the, you don't even know what I look like 19. We've had other articles that just change 19 7 5. And as, even as the Finance Committee, we don't always know what that ties in with. Um, and so that's why I make that comment. <laughs> but right Excuse now. Me, you're not the only uh, one. And, and sometimes it's with zoning bylaws. And sometimes we come back. And it's challenge, and it was the comma was in the wrong place, mm -hmm. and the, so the person wins. So it, it's very difficult items to, to decide at here in town meeting. And sometimes we've added on, you know, should the, just even the grammatical things to make things right. So for zoning articles, they do make my head hurt. Mm -hmm. um, how are the, the vape shops, vape <laughs> shop, shops, regulated now? Board of Health regulations mainly regulate them, and to make something, to make one thing clear, this does not prevent other stores where vape shops are not the main. This is for meant for shops where vaping products are all they do, or it's their main thrust. It's a principal use. There are stores that sell vape products where, as an accessory item, like maybe a 7-Eleven or a CVS or something like that, could. Um, this does not stop that from happening. This simply regulates. Um, vape shops as a principal use other than in the industrial zoning district by special permit. So it doesn't eliminate the ability for vape products to be sold in Walpole. It just regulates it. So, um, you know, that I just, I just wanted to, to make that clear. So um, this basically allows, allows the town to kind of take a breath because, you know, again, there are trendy, there are trendy establishments that come up every once in a while. That old vape pun, take a breath. Yeah. yeah, exactly, no pun intended, sorry about that. I'm glad but, uh, so but yeah, so, yeah, and believe I'm, me. I'm glad you brought you, that part up because, you know, um, you could have, you go into some towns and some of these convenience stores, they have like fake cartons of milk and this, and over there you have, you know, 1,200 square feet and it's, that's essentially a, the Kino parlor. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so we still, someone could still, set up a business mm -hmm. like they have right now in one of our convenience stores and set up their vaping area. They could, yes. And even with this article. Correct. So they could just, yes. okay. Yes, they so could. they're just people then. And so right now the one that is in the uh, CBD, uh, I, that's, that's the CBD. CBD Joe's, yes, central business district. <laughs> I, I said that for Joe's purpose so I you know, learned some of the zoning stuff. But uh, <laughs> 
that one there, they just got in because we don't have an article. It like is that. a lot by right, correct. And it didn't even have to go through any site plan approval, any special permit process, because right. it was allowed by right, and it didn't trigger any of the thresholds for site plan approval. Has the zoning board voted on this? No. You're waiting your public hearing before you vote? Well, this is a petition of the Board of Selectmen. Yes. Will the, vo the planning board be voting on it? Yes, we have public hearings sp scheduled for April 4th. Thanks. Three, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I understand that a special permit is more restrictive than a, a cycling. What are the kind, what are the bases upon which uh, a vape shop proposal could be denied? I believe under special permits, it, it can't create a nuisance. Um, it has to blend in with the neighborhood. Um, it can't create noise, dust, um, thing, things of that <coughs> nature. So, or if it creates, um, if there's something about the project, say parking or circulation that creates a traffic or public safety hazard, if they don't have proper emergency access to the building, things like that, mm. um, that, that could potentially deny the project. Uh, would there be, would a possible basis be that we already have two of them, we don't need? Not at this point, because we don't have a cap on the number of vape shops. <laughs> Thank you. Andrew? Um, I just have a, a few thoughts to share with you where I'm coming from and then, and then follow up with two or three questions. So first, I really want to strongly support Walpole being an anti-tobacco leader of the state and, and federal government being an anti-tobacco leader. Why? I mean, there's obviously just a, a proven public health case for the social cost of tobacco addiction uh, being very high, smoking in particular. But e-cigs, nicotine addiction more broadly. Um, Let's take that as we go. Second, I also support, you know, targeted enforcement against youth who are either using e-cigarettes or tobacco um, more generally. So what can that mean? Maybe at the state level, raising the age to purchase retail tobacco from 18 to 21. I support that. So I kind of get somewhat where the intention of this article is coming from. That said, I also support giving businesses in town an even playing field not granting monopolies to existing businesses, not having a patchwork whack-a-mole process through our zoning that favors some businesses versus others. Um, moreover, you know, when, when government intervenes in markets, it should be as surgical as possible and avoid blunt tools. So um, I like the intention of this article somewhat, but I'm skeptical whether zoning is too blunt an instrument to fix this problem. So here's my first question. Um, do we have special permit uh, requirements on other retail sales of nicotine or cigarettes? I'd have to look at our zoning bylaws. Yeah, I don't know that either. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Do you know other example businesses that have to have a special permit? I do, but uh, not off the top of my head. I can't think of specific exa examples, Andrew, unless I pulled out our zoning bylaws. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, like for instance, um, adult uses. Yeah. That's something that is relegated to a certain district like the industrial district by special permit so that's one off the top of my head adult uses do you, what do you mean adult uses use your imagination <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think the example <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, video, video stores <laughs> yeah. video stores yeah. got it, got it. Apparel. so like adam and eve or whatever yes. Yes. got it okay so is there an intention to just ban <laughs> vape shops more broadly excuse me is there an intention this is an article sponsored by the Board of Selectmen. Is there intention to ban vape shops more broadly? I ha I don't I don't know the answer to that question. So um, how do you mean more broadly? Like have a ban on vape shops? I don't believe like, that's the oh. intention, but I can't speak for the Board of Selectmen. Okay. So is there last question? Is there an option for in under Massachusetts state law for local local municipalities <coughs> to have excise taxes for tobacco or alcohol or e-cigarettes? I don't believe so for vape shops, e cigarettes. I don't believe so. You can't have like a you can't have a tobacco tax for the town of Walpole that doesn't apply to the I town don't of Sheriff. So. No, okay. Mayor, maybe Mayor it's just the state level. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought too, right? Like we can't raise the minimum raise age to purchase to 21, nor can we. Yes, you can. Yeah, we can. Well, we can. Oh, we, we can. Do. We do. Yes, we yeah. have. Oh, we have. We have. Yeah, we can change the age. It's going to be 21 to purchase tobacco in the town of Walpole. Okay, good to know. Um, you have to be 21 to go into the vape shop. Got it. Okay, so fully supportive of and that. Andrew, just to be clear, we do have um, extensive Board of Health regulations on tobacco right. and vaping and things like that. So there are Board of Health regulations that also regulate this. Gotcha. So last thing, uh, no more questions, last comment. Again, I just want to re reiterate, I'm skeptical of this because I just don't think it's our role to, 
to decide, or moreover, the unelected Zoning Board of Appeals to decide there's too many of a given type of business. Um, I would fully support an excise tax on e-cigarettes. I would fully support, I think it's already, you said it's already been done, raising the middle age to purchase. The reason I do this is for commercial business reasons. The two vape shops currently in town, this is like gold manna from heaven for them. And I just don't like this, this approach through zoning. I like the intention. I respect the Board of Selectmen's petition for this, um, but I'm, I'm very skeptical. Maybe you can change my mind. <laughs> Richard. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've worked with Chief Carmichael and Robin Chappelle, who have put in endless amounts of hours, you know, trying to work with the people at the high school, you know, the, the children or the young adults that are up there, and steer them away from drug and alcohol, marijuana. I worked with uh, Chief Carmichael when he came in front of us for the marijuana dispensary. We made it so, and unfortunately, you become a little bit on the defensive as these initiatives get approved by the liberal legislature, it's just there, and all of a sudden you gotta deal with it. So we actually put the marijuana dispensary, could only be an industrial zone down on Industrial Road, and it's in the bylaw, I think. Chief can speak to it. It was so strict to keep the marijuana out that they went over to uh, the corner of North Street uh, where the country store is, and on the other side of the street, there was a gas station that went out of business. They wanted to put it in Foxborough because they see it as a great opportunity. You know, people going to the games and everything. Foxborough <laughs> went nuts over it, and uh, for some reason, they were able to do some additional legislation. I don't know if Chief can speak to any of this. Yeah, I was going to suggest too if we could just maybe, I hate to put him on the spot, Chief, if you want to kind of talk to the public safety yeah. Um, yeah. components to this too. Thank you. So, uh, what was the question about the, about Foxborough? When we made our article for that town meeting with Stephanie, yeah. In Robin Chappelle, we put it that they had to, the only spot in town was down on Industrial Road. And that drove the person who wanted to open here. It was an unfavorable position to open a store way down there. If anybody's familiar <coughs> with Production Road, it's really bad down there. So they left us and went over to Foxborough. And it created a dilemma for them. But I think the reason they went to Foxborough is we were trying to from our defensive posture, look at it offensive. And we were successful. We got them to go over to Foxborough and then they dealt with the problem themselves. But I think the passion that I've sensed from the deputy and the chief and from Robin is the health hazard at the high school is immense. So you go in the restrooms up there, there are vape units all over the floor there you go to the schools even the uh the school up there off old post where it's middle school you'll find the little cartridges and everything in the parking lot it's it's really big tobacco hooking the kids on a new form of cigarette so i agree with you a little bit andrew i'm surprised a little at your position on it but i i think after listening to john and to robin I'm pretty strongly committed to it. And I don't know that you want to add. Sure. Um, well, so one thing to be clear on is that vape shops are different than marijuana establishments. So we, me, Walpole um, put medical marijuana establishments and zoned them in the industrial area up on Industrial Road. Then uh, several, four years later to be exact, we um, opted out of putting in recreational facilities in, Ma in, in Walpole. Um, unlike Colorado, Massachusetts had a little bit different um, way of going about that. In Colorado, you had to opt into the program. In Massachusetts, you have to opt out. Everybody was already in, so you had to opt out if you did not want it in, in the community. So Walpole did that. So now what we have is medical marijuana is on Industrial Road. Recreational at this point right now is, is banned because we opted out. The, as far as vape shops, a um, couple issues that come up with that, and, and I've met with them. I've been up there multiple times talking with the uh, 
proprietors that own the place and there's one issue that's that's currently going on that's the issue with CBD or hemp and they in the sales of CBD and hemp oils um, and I will uh, let me just touch on quickly my perspective as as the police chief for a minute too and as a dad um, WAPO has obviously an issue with substance abuse just like every other community in in the region uh, overdoses and that kind of thing you know we all, we talk a lot about how we're gonna rid Massachusetts of the overdoses how we're gonna bring them down and really the ways that we do that are you know safe prescribing and um, uh, not can and, and first responders have an ac access to these drugs so that we can help people and minimize harm for people that are addicted currently but there's a whole other side to that and the other side of that is addiction in the first place and we we know from research that the way addiction starts is typically during adolescence and uh, some very important predictive factors are early age of onset so the earlier that kids initiate to drug use the more likely they may be susceptible to further drug addiction later on in life um, others are perception of harm how how our kids view the dangerousness of a substance can weigh into their uh, decision making on whether or not they want to initiate to a substance in the first place what are those substances typically alcohol tobacco marijuana those are the easiest accessible uh, and available drugs to our teenagers so um, when does initiation occur typically between 11 years old up to 21 22 years old and then initiation to any type of substance typically drops drastically so there's that there's that very important time frame during adolescence where we should always focus on um, as Dick mentioned yes we do have some issues there are kids already um, excessively vaping in Walpole um, as seventh grade eighth grade and up we, we deal with it quite often our school resource officers deal with it every day the, the um, staff in our schools are dealing with it consistently why is that a problem because if kids are initiating to these substances you know to bat whether it's tobacco or whether it's what we have uh, a trend <coughs> now where we have kids that are using vape products vape pens um, and that type of thing but they're actually consuming BHO butane honey oil they're they're um, smoking uh, THC pure THC not the marijuana from 20 years ago the this is the extracted oils and everything with very high 90 percent THC levels in it now the vape shops can't sell that stuff um, so that's not an issue um, but you have to think of from my perspective anyways you have to think of the perception of kids we have two that are here right now um, I can assure you that uh, kids hang around those locations um, and Mr. Flowers just brought up the point of compliance Board of Health compliance and doing compliance checks for uh, age sales is very important and they are very effective uh, we do them with the alcohol liquor licenses and um, it's a very effective way to do it having these stores um, could affect things like perception of harm how our kids are going to view that substance the dangerousness the dangerousness of it um, and so forth as far as the CBD issue in Massachusetts um, there's this a little confusion because we've already been dealing with the ha the, with the the vape stores right now currently with Robin and they want to sell CBD oils and um, the problem is in Massachusetts we redefine marijuana when we legalize it so marijuana is anything with 0.3 percent THC and above and anything under 0.3 percent THC levels in it is defined as hemp so in order to sell hemp in Massachusetts you have to have a license from the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources in order to get that license it has to be grown here tested here harvested here processed here manufactured here all the way up through that process until it's sold and it has to be tested at every process along the way the stuff that is being sold currently is not licensed by MDAR it has not been tested here um, and what we've done here in Walpole sometimes we've bought CBD oils and um, stuff from stores and we've tested it field tested it with and it's come up positive for THC so Robin has been very clear that she does not want them selling anything that's that's a hemp product it did get through um, they did also uh, federally reduce it from a, a schedule one drug down to 
Schedule 5, I think. Um, and therefore, essentially what's going to happen is you'll be able to sell hemp products across the country, but it will be regulated under the FDA, and you can't have interstate sales. So there's this whole thing going on as far as that's concerned. Um, and I know I went on a little bit of a uh, <laughs> tirade there, but at the end of the day, um, from my perspective, you know, you have to keep our uh, <coughs> adolescents in mind, how they perceive it and everything, and um, how you going forward. The one thing that I just want to kind of mention, too, so I've heard a couple from a couple of different people about the, the impact of the market, and I just want to point out this isn't necessarily um, limiting the number of vape shops. It's not trying to put a particular business out. It's more just trying to manage the land use of, of the vape shops. So kind of along the lines of what the chief just said, um, it would, you know, now vape shops wouldn't necessarily wouldn't be allowed next to the 7-Eleven as, as kids are coming out of school. It would be limited to the, to the industrial industrial park. So as far as the limitations, like I understand where you're, where you're coming from, about the government's role um, you know, in the market. I, I, you know, I don't think this is this is an article, and you're the economist, Andrew, maybe you disagree, but this is, I don't see this as government getting involved in, in necessarily the market. So, but I'll let John kind of Yeah, I'd like to too. piggyback on that because I heard, Thank you know, you. I know that whole, you know, getting into the market and everything. However, um, one thing that the town is starting to talk about is our downtown and the downtown revitalization. And you go to certain downtowns, certain old downtowns, and there are certain uses you see that are telltale signs of a failing downtown, fly-by-night religious stores, uh, religious establishments, um, cell phone businesses. There are certain businesses that are telltale signs that it's an old downtown that is no longer thriving. On the other, so when you think about the future of the downtown, you know, right now you mentioned the central business district. With vape shops becoming so prevalent, if they're allowed by right in the CBD and nothing is done about it, does Walpole want a downtown with multiple vape shops near the new apartments? Or do you want different uses that will encourage different things? So that's what zoning bylaws do, is it shapes areas as far as this is we what we want here, this is we want what we want here. It's not saying we don't want vape shops at all. It's just, like you said, like Patrick mentioned, it's like the, the two that are here came in because they were unchecked. They didn't have to go through any approval process. So. This is getting a handle on it, and yes, this 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 article will affect the future of the of the town center and the downtown because now um, they won't they they wouldn't be allowed in the town center. They'd have to go um, by special permit to the industrial zoning district. So that is part of it too, is thinking about shaping the future of the town and where you want certain uses and uh, where it's most acceptable for the town. I was going to make a motion. Okay. I just had one question. Um, does this, from an industry standpoint, if I'm the vape industry and now you're trying to zone me out of areas I want to go, you know, can they sue the town? No, no, no they, they can't. can't. So nope. We've been, nope. They have no. Okay. Nope. Every town had the. The only time that can happen is instances like when the whole medical marijuana came out and the, the state was mandated that <coughs> towns had to deal with medical marijuana you had to have a place or when they mandate you have to have a place for adult uses or whatever um you can you can put it where you want as long as you don't unduly restrict it in other words you know prohibit it without really prohibiting it this is not doing that this is not saying you can't we can't have vape shops here so unless it's something like that where it's something egregious where it's clear a town is trying to prohibit something even though they've been told they can't no this is this is okay. a different case where this wouldn't lead to litigation I get a quick question um, so this would not impact somebody who wants to open up a cigar bar type establishment only for vaping cigar it bar it only for vaping <laughs> In other words, not sure I follow. Like a lounge? Yeah, like a lounge that's exclusively for vaping. So not a retail store. Though. Right, it's not a retail store. They're selling a larger percentage. If their main product is the sale of the sale, sale of that product, it would it would fall. Yeah, that was my concern. Is where does yes. it fall? Yeah. If they're okay. selling the product, yes, it would fall within yeah. that. Okay. You're interested in a business opportunity? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was. I was innovating. <clears throat> no, I was. I was concerned with the downtown and some other uses. Okay. Uh, I just have a quick kind of quick question. Um, 
I certainly don't want to see our downtown filled with vape shops. And there is this time frame that we are still open to more vape shops popping up in Walpole because town meeting is not until May. So there's quite a few more. Um, without putting a cap, I realize that we really have minimized it to industrial, but without Let me just clarify a your question before you go on. As soon as, what happens with zoning bylaw amendments is, I believe as soon as we hold the, f the public hearing, the first public hearing ad appears in the newspapers, which is next week, I believe the, the zoning is frozen on that until town meeting acts on this. So it actually is retroactive, even though it takes the Attorney General 90 days to act on zoning bylaw amendments, I believe it goes retroactively back to that first public hearing ad. Yeah, that's my understanding also. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just saying, without putting a cap, it seems like we're still leaving ourselves open, all, even if we are restricting it to um, just industrial areas. I just want to, as a disclaimer, when uh, Chief Carmichael Robin and uh, Stephanie Mercandetti and I sat down, we thought that was a, a <coughs> good place to put it because it was an attractive and easily accessible to people from all around down in the industrial Yes, you're, you're right. I mean, it doesn't mean, like I said, it doesn't mean the town can't have vape shops. It's just I mean, it's relegated to a certain zoning district. And now they'd have to go through a public hearing application project uh, process with the Zoning Board of Appeals. So whereas they did, the existing businesses didn't have to go through that. So there would be a public process involved with that. Mm -hmm. Question, what, do we have to vote on this tonight? We do not. It went the public hearing for this April is April fourth. But the book is April first. We can still do a recommendation for town meeting and follow up. I, I move favorable action tonight. Yeah, I, I, I would prefer not. Okay. I have one so we have to get a second. Or not. Okay. Is is there a second for Susan? I second it. Okay. Okay. Susan for favorable action seconded by Lisa. Right. Uh, the one up off is the, the Dunkin' Donuts office in McMorgan's. Is that light manufacturing? Is that industrial? Given that it was where I, the warehouse was. I don't know what the zone of that property is. Off I don't the top of my do you know? Yeah. I think it's LM. Mm. And so light, the, light manufacturing. Okay, yeah. so the, it's just going back to light, light manufacturing. Light limited. Limited. <coughs> limited. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah, so either one of those two, it wouldn't, this, it yeah. wouldn't be allowed right. under this. Right. Record. No, it just goes back to the Andrew's point to the people that if they're coming in after this, these people just had that head start on it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, yeah. that happens all the time with right. when zoning bylaws are changed. Okay. We have a motion. Any other questions or comments? All in favor, please say, actually, all in favor, please raise their hand. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All opposed? Abstain. So we got Ron. Abstain. Uh, Ron's abstaining. Okay. So Denny. Mark. Kathleen. And Andrew. <coughs> and Ron abstained. Nine four one favorable action. Mm -hmm. Can I ask for the members that voted no if there are more information that could be provided I guess for the next meeting? You know, That's why I, I abstain I just yeah. have to digest this. Okay. Yeah. I, is there any additional documentation that we can provide maybe at a future meeting? I'd like to learn more. I, yeah. I, I don't like the approach. Okay. Initially, your last comment about the uh, center district, district made me question, and I would have preferred to wait and get a little more data. But since we voted tonight, I stuck with the original. Okay. So it's time to reconsider if you think there's more information to bring to the table. Yeah, it's fine. Right. Okay. All right, then the other two articles are just uh, two articles petitions yes. by the planning board for APBs. Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, in light of the fact that we have a new housing production plan update, mm -hmm. this, is, this is in line with that. Um, it would tweak the two different types of age qualified, uh, qualified villages that are currently in our zoning bylaws. Right now, um, Article 20 deals with 15-acre um, AQVs. And right now, the, the item that would be deleted, it's, it states that um, developers of 15-acre AQVs are encouraged but not required to designate at least 15% of the units within the development as affordable. What this would do was it, it, developers of 15-acre AQVs would be required to designate at least 10%. So the percentage is a little bit less, but it would be a requirement rather than a suggestion. 
So in an effort to move forward in diversifying the housing stock, and this would affect those uh, residents uh, 55 and older, um, to establish some kind of affordability component when an age-qualified village comes forward. Um, to piggyback that, Article 21 uh, accomplishes something uh, very, very similar with the 10-acre AQVs, where it would add the requirement that 10% of units within a 10-acre AQV would need to be developed as affordable. It would maintain what's currently in the regulations um, that states that if a developer wants to develop 15% or more of a 10-acre uh, AQV as affordable, then there, are, then there are density bonuses available. There's some flexibility as far as density that the planning board would be willing to um, negotiate with the developer. So those are the changes. It just, um, again, adds a minimum requirement of affordability to the 10 and 15 acre age qualified villages when they, when that, they come. Then Andrew. All right, question I have is why did you d limit it to 10% instead of staying with the original 15? Well, no, um, the fifth, yeah, that's a good question, Joe. He was the author of these. Briefly, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> that word's not in his dictionary. <laughs> I gotta go to the airport, Joe. <laughs> you know what? Um, if <laughs> hey, Michelle, what? Don't give him a seat. Oh. If you go too high, by, uh, from what I have read, you may affect the production of houses in the town. Now, I don't know if that, from what I've been <coughs> reading, it seems like inclusionary zoning, and that's what this is, doesn't have an effect, okay? And there are a lot of towns, even around us, where, um, like Westwood, they've just got an Article 7 on this spring annual town meeting warrant where the total number of dwellings, they, they one to seven, no affordable units. Eight to nine, one. 10 to 15, two. 16 to 22, three. 23 to 26, four. Any more than 27, they have to have 15% of a total uh, number of dwellings have to be affordable. But um, there are a lot of studies both ways that uh, indicate, um, let me see if I can get it. <clears throat> I come in organized and then I, everything sort of goes to pot after that. Um, well, excuse that pun after that last. Was, yeah. <laughs> 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 if, if you require too much, too high of a percentage of affordable, the developer could argue that you're making the project financially unfeasible, mm -hmm. speaking of appeals and yeah. potential lawsuits. So <clears throat> if you make, if you create a hardship in, you know, requiring too much of a percentage of affordable, then the developer could say, well, then you're making this project financially unfeasible for me. Um, Mass.gov, um, smart growth, smart energy, toolkit modules, inclusionary zoning. Um, I'll just go right to the end. A common concern about inclusionary zoning is that it may slow the pace of development, exasperating the affordable housing supply problem and acting as a disincentive for private developers who may be considering investing in a community. Studies have shown that inclusionary zoning does not, in fact, slow the pace of private development in a community. Residential development rates are driven much more by the strength of the local housing market and broader economic and market trends. And if you go on to this other website, it's called inclusionaryzoning.org. Uh, it's very encompassing about inclusionary zoning. It will say, one of the questions is, do inclusionary zoning housing policies slow down or stop the production of new mark, market rate houses? And the answer is no, because there's supposedly no credible evidence to suggest that inclusionary housing policies lead to a reduction in the production of new market rate housing. But in the same website, <coughs> will inclusionary programs prevent new development and therefore um, make the housing problem worse? <coughs> and the answer is possibly, 
there is some evidence that it is possible to set affordable housing requirements so high that they cause developers not to build or landowners not to sell. Now, the 15% that you mentioned, Josette, was actually written by Liz Dennehy, um, how many mm -hmm. planners before John, uh, and that was in response to the Pulte project, mm -hmm. okay, which is 186 units. Mm -hmm. And so not, no planning board member had the hands in that drafting of that article. That was drafted uh, after Pulte threatened the selectman with a 40B and the selectman didn't want the 40B in that particular area because they were coming in with 240 units and the selectman thought that that was way too much. So the only way they renegotiated and they came back and said we'll do 186 or whatever but you know this is basically uh, what we wanted. But Liz, this is 15%. It's not a requirement. Okay. <coughs> the only way we're going to get to our 10% is start having an effect on the numerator and denominator. And if we don't have that effect, we're going to find ourselves well below the rate. And um, because every market rate housing right. development that comes in adds to the overall inventory and kicks us. Farther mm -hmm. from that 10%. Yeah, we were so this is a way to kind of, <coughs> to, to use an analogy to kind of stem the tide a little bit mm -hmm. and at least start working towards the 10% with some of these projects and with some, uh, in addition to some other measures that are recommended in the housing reduction plan, get towards that 10%. And you want to get to the 10%. Now, I was never a big proponent of this until you start to do all this research and you start to find out what's going on elsewhere. And just last month, a uh, Rhode Island developer wants to build 320 apartments in eight four-story buildings on 25 acres at the end of Home Depot Road in Plymouth with a quarter of the unit set aside as affordable housing. So they're coming in as a 40B. And Plymouth's housing, uh, affordability housing percentage is 3.2%. So they have no, no say over anything. The problem I have with this is that the property is currently raw, undeveloped land that is zoned for highway commercial uses, such as offices, hotels, restaurants, and manufacturing. And as I mentioned a thousand times before at town meeting and at planning board meetings, we got a dual tax rate. Commercial pays substantially higher than residential. And if you want to continue to bump up your residential real estate tax bill, keep on losing commercial property. So we need to get a hold of our, control our own destiny. We need to get to the 10% so we can say, we don't want 40B here. We don't want affordable housing here. Now, I don't know how, how deep you want to go into this. Okay. <laughs> so um, um, I should, I'll say two things. One, as the chair of the Walpole Housing Partnership Committee and another as myself on the FinCom. Um, I should report that on our February 20th meeting, the Walpole Housing Partnership Committee voted favorable action unanimously for Article 2500 and favorable <coughs> action 401 for Article 21. So th that's just me reporting as the chair of that committee. Uh, I, and now I want to stop and speak from for myself, not speak for the committee. Um, I want to applaud Joe for this. Joe and I have talked a lot about these two articles. I was one of the um, housing partnership members that voted in, in both of those, uh, in favor of both of them. Um, Joe and I may not always agree on some zoning issues, but I think his, his articulation of, of why you need inclusionary zoning is really well done. And these articles, uh, would I do it differently? Sure. I mean, you could, everyone can, uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? If I quibble with 10% or 15% or, you know, uh, frankly, I think the biggest thrust here is that we should do an inclusionary zoning bylaw for the town as a whole, not for AQVs. That's something I'm going to work with Joe, with the entire Walpole Housing Partnership, with John Charbonneau, uh, with Jim Johnson, with a lot of other folks for the fall town meeting this year is to have, you know, this just makes sense. If we want to get to 10%, the first thing we want to do is not fall behind. Yeah. And that yeah. means requiring at least a certain percentage of future big developments to have inclusionary zoning. And so the reason, and, and, just, and this is my question <coughs> for you, Joe, uh, the reason you told me, and maybe you can elaborate on this, why you're just targeting AQVs and not doing a full-on inclusionary right. zoning bylaw. This bylo. was a, a great question. 
This was extremely easy to do. All you had to do was go to the AQV section of the zoning bylaws and just change a couple of sentences. And all of a sudden now, AQVs are subjected to inclusionary zoning. And why did, you go, why did I go after this? Uh, a bunch of reasons. If you look at what the planning board has done over the last three years, single family homes uh, are pretty much out, <coughs> out of vogue. Um, since 2016, just 68 uh, lots have uh, been approved. And in my uh, time on the planning board, only 12 called <coughs> the four subdivisions. Where the action is, is apartments and AQBs. Three major apartments, Moose Hill, 157, 157 units, 40 affordable. You know, you can't say anything there. We got our percentage. It built, it built to the 10%. Liberty Village and Corcoran. Corcoran was 192, no affordable units. Liberty Village, 152 units, no affordable units. A total of 344. At 10%, we missed out on a numerated denominator of 35 units. So now we're, we're consistently going below the number, okay? On AQVs, we have five AQVs in town. The first one was a long time ago, Riverwalk Commons, Rose Court, and East Walpole. Before my time on the board, 44 units, no affordable. Delcor Drive on Marissa Lane, right off here on uh, School Street, 40 units, no affordable. Brookside Village just got approved before, that's off of Pine Street on the other side of Route 1, 30 units, no affordable. I went down there and I talked to the people down at Brookside Village. And where are the people coming from? They're coming from, yeah, some are coming from Walpole. They're coming from Maine, Westwood, and Sharon. That's where they're coming from. And uh, no affordability at, at all. $600,000 was the model. Um, then you have Pennington Crossing, which I forget the new name, but it's all, oh, that's the Pulte Project. That's, the, that's the new name. That is the yeah, new name. Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> 186 <laughs> units, no affordable. And before the board right now is Bristol Brothers on Renmar, 105 units, uh, AQB. Uh, that's a continuous public hearing. And I asked during the hearing, uh, to the owner of the project, will there be any affordable units? And the answer was, everything is affordable. <laughs> Starting price, a half a million dollars. There's no affordable units, no SHI. <coughs> so here we have, uh, what, uh, 2, 2, 16, 300, uh, almost 400, 405 units. We should have 40, 10%, uh, we missed out <coughs> on 40 units. So between apartments, and between AQVs, this is where all the action is. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take much. All you have to do is go to the newspaper, Sunday's Boston Globe, and you'll see all the AQVs all over the place. Pulte has them in three, four locations, and they're just cranking out the same type of building, where it looks like the same type of building. I went down to Sharon. I saw Brook Meadow on the golf course. 52 units, I don't think there's any affordable there. They cited $800,000. Heather Hills Country Club is coming online in Plainville. Uh, that's a 27 hole golf course on 225 acres and, and built in 1950. So we got a few more yeah. questions, so. They're all, they're not, none of these are gonna yeah. be affordable. So <laughs> everything here is uh, trying to get to the affordability, try to be, be about five percent. <coughs> Megan? So I have, a, I have a comment and then a question. Um, in light of the data you just shared and um, Andrew's comment about a, a broader um, inclusionary zoning um, change in the future, I just would say that I would be in favor of, of bumping this percentage in the future as well as a broader plan because it's obvious that we have a lot of catching up to do to get to that 10%. Well, so. Mansfield inclusionary zoning, they don't give any bonuses. I'm a dead set against bonuses. And the reason I'm dead set against bonuses for even with inclusionary zoning is that I am pro neighborhood. 
I've sat on the board and I've had all these neighborhoods come in fighting different types of developments and I respect you know what they want and I don't want to see it. and I'm, and I'm for um, you know everybody having the same uh, distinguished type of development not you know that oh that must be enough that unit over there must be affordable because it looks different and it's more dense I don't, you know, that's not acceptable. To, to the point, yeah. this doesn't preclude from bumping this up when we do right. a review right. of the zoning bylaws. Yep. It also doesn't preclude an inclusion of zoning bylaw amendment during yep. the recodification sometime in the future. So mm -hmm. this doesn't mm -hmm. preclude any of that. Without. Yeah. I just want to say that while I support this, I would be in favor of broader efforts in this regard. And I thank Joe and Andrew and, and everyone who's worked so hard on this because I know that uh, zoning is hard. Um, okay, question. Um, Article 21 specifically states, as a condition of the special permit, these dwelling units must also be permanently deed restricted as yes. affordable. Article 20 does not have that language. That's, Can, uh, okay. that's, it. that's what exists. Um, I, I don't know what, why it differentiates for one another. Okay. I, I'm recommending that you do not vote this article tonight or the, the other one. Uh, I sent an email to town council this afternoon, although I sent it a couple of weeks ago and I just got the answer, but with the follow-up, is that my original language, uh, some of it was left out. Oh, okay. So, okay. so that I, would include that. I want to know where, what happened to it. Yeah. And okay. one of the things that is very important <coughs> to me was Part of the language was that priority was to be given to local residents. Oh, so there's more missing language than mm -hmm. just the deed restriction. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that I've been discussed at the public hearing on April 4th, and I'm sure we will make a motion to make sure that language is included. Okay. So, Susan? I'm You're good? Yep. I'm good. Kathleen? At the risk of going on and on, but. So, <laughs> If you're going to be doing language things, I know at town meeting we've gone back and forth on the word may and whether that is granting permission or saying we will do it. Remember we had this discussion? I regard so, may and shall to be permissive. Well, yeah. you may <laughs> want to just make sure town council weighs right. in on that too. But that's been a battle. Clever. <laughs> I'm going to move for a recommendation at town meeting on both articles. Second. Seconded by Susan. 20 and 21. 20 and 21. Do we need to vote them separately or are we comfortable voting the recommendation of town meeting as a block? I'm sorry, what does it mean? Uh, in other words, we won't put our vote forward until after the book gets published and their public hearing gets done. They'll come back, give us information, yeah. and then we'll vote it. Because the language is subject to change. Added, yeah. Speaks to the question yeah. about deed restrictiveness <coughs> and right. also local preference as well. Yeah. All in favor of recommendation of town meeting say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 1400. I'm going to recommend we move the meeting minutes to next meeting. Um, does, does, the planning, <laughs> does the planning board want to quickly speak to the fields project? Um, Did you say quickly? Yeah, I was going to say <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I can provide a general yes. update. Yeah. If you want to know if the planning board wants to give an update on the fields, just yes, 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 yes. I would just say at the time being that. So I think uh, Jim had provided a memorandum to the finance committee with um, what was sent to the, the planning board as part of the site plan application. Um, I think many of you were in attendance at the planning board meeting last Thursday. Um, just that the, the public hearing has been continued yes. till April 4th. So uh, that public hearing is ongoing. Um, as far as the field projects is concerned, uh, Jim and I are meeting with Weston and Samson tomorrow morning uh, to wrap up the bid, uh, the bid uh, documents, which will go out in the streets uh, next Monday. And then we're still planning for them to come back uh, on April 11th to give us time to review those the bid um, the bids that have come in to to provide the committee with an update by April 29th. So unless no, <laughs> um, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, well, we're talking about 20 and 21 art numbers on the articles. Um, where this is kind of in limbo, does Hypothetically, if a decision is made on this, does this go retroactive to what's going through the mill right now as far as 
So it would only be after town meeting and after the, the state one, approves. The one that we are now looking at is grandfather. It's it's frozen because they got their application in before that first okay. legal ad appeared in the paper, as I stated before. So okay. AQVs a special permit requires four votes of a permit board in order to get an AQV, and you have an accompanying Thanks, site plan <laughs> review simultaneously. Thank you. Very. Um, since Article 13 was in our agenda um, and we can vote for recommendation at town meeting, I'm going to move so to recommend Article 13 for town meeting. Second. Seconded by Susan. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay, Richards abstain. 1301. And then the only other item in your packet uh, was an updated schedule. Um, yeah. Just want to draw that to your attention that this Thursday's meeting is going to be with the Chiefs scheduled to begin at 6 30 uh, here. 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 That's right. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then I know Jim's made this uh, this offer before, and I just would want to reiterate that, that you know, if this committee ever has any questions of any of the department heads, the Chiefs or otherwise, please feel free to reach out to them also directly. For more information. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved by Thank Susan, you. seconded by Denny. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. 14 0, 0. Six.